Welcome, everybody. This is Pagan World in our first premiere of Ides of Oberon. Ides of Oberon is going to be a monthly series presented on Pagan World by the father of uh, modern paganism, Oberon Zell himself, someone who has been a big influence in the world today. He's brought us across the decades with every type of idea and thinking that has been offered to us. And that's it. Now I want to present and hand it over to Oberon Zell. Welcome, my friends, to the first episode of my new monthly video broadcast, The Ides of Oberon. Ides was the ancient Roman term for the 15th day of the month, which will be the schedule for this show. I'm Oberon Zell, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the exciting Pagan World Project, which I'm proud to represent. As a founding father and the first person to adopt the identity of Pagan for the nascent movement in 1967, I love this community with its unique potential to lead our wounded world into a healing and an awakening. I'm sure you all remember Witch Fox, the witch's voice. It was an amazing website that offered quality connections on a local to a global basis. Operated by Ren and Fritz Walker from 1997 until the end of 2019, Witch Fox offered meaningful connections that helped create the online community. The shock of the end of Witchvox and its erasure from the web has left a painful hole, as well as a myth and legacy, leaving the community to its own resources. Over the past year, the sense of loss of this wonderful tool to community building has grown. Our scattered people want to connect to the greater pagan community, to come home. The internet today allows us to connect and share our communities in ways never before possible or even imaginable. Pagan World will provide a central directory for you to discover your local and global groups, shops, services, and events. We intend to provide access to teachers, guides, classes, and circles for as many seekers as possible. And as a lover of great festivals, many of which I attend, for them to be better listed and even more accessible to our growing community. So, just how big is our pagan community? How many of us are there? Recent surveys have found that the number of people identifying as pagan is about the same as those identifying as Wiccan. The American Religious Identification Survey at Trinity College, conducted in 2013, reported, quote, the United States Census Bureau's American Community Survey found 342,000 Wiccans and 340,000 Pagans in the United States in the year 2008. So based on this and subsequent surveys, the website religioustolerance.org provides a more current estimate, now only two years out of date. Oddly, however, they conflate all modern Pagans under the generic category of Wicca rather than paganism, as should be the case. Here's what they say about our numbers. Quote, we conclude that the best estimate we can make based on inadequate hard data is that the number of Wiccan, i.e. pagan adults in the US had increased from 602,000 in 2008 to 2 million by the end of 2015. If one were to include teens, which religious surveys generally don't, we estimate over 3 million pagan practitioners were active in the US by mid-2008, by mid-2018. They go on to say, this number is believed to be significantly lower than the actual value because many pagans would probably be among the 5.4% of respondents who refused to reveal their religion in the 2008 ARIS study. Also, many pagans probably do respond to a polling question, but may give a wrong answer. So, with 3 million pagan practitioners as of 2018, projecting to 4 million by now, modern paganism, including Wicca, is now officially recognized as the second largest religion in the United States after Christianity. And there are were listed 70.6 million Christians in 2014, but their numbers were dropping by one percentage point per year. 
And pagans are the fastest growing group in terms of percentage. For comparison, in 2014, there were 1.9 million Jews, 0.9 million Muslims, 0.7 million Buddhists, and 0.4 million Hindus in the United States. By the way, it should also be noted that in 2014, there were 15.8 million NOTAs, no particular religious affiliation. This number is increasing almost one percentage point a year, the same rate as the number of Christians is declining. Hmm. That same year, agnostics were numbered at 4 million and atheists at 3.1 million. I believe that many of these people could potentially identify as pagan if they were presented with the option. Now for this next episode of my new show, I'd like to give a little background. In the past half century, we've seen many dates proposed predicting the end of the world and other cataclysmic events. 1966, 1982, 1994, 1996, 2000, 2011, and of course, 2012. Specifying a particular date for a future event creates a magic of anticipation that helps to align expectations toward that particular focus creating a certain degree of self-fulfilling prophecy, depending on how many people believe in it. Now, according to the book of Genesis, the Lord created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. So the idea of cycles of seven became deeply embedded in Judeo-Christian mythology, as in seven days of the week, seven planets, seven alchemical metals, seven archangels, and many other correspondences of seven. It became popular to equate the seven days of creation with 7,000-year periods of human history, based on 2 Peter 3.8, with the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. So the idea was that there would be 6,000 years of history, from the creation onward, at the end of which would come the apocalyptic battle of Armageddon, in which armies of angels would contend with and defeat armies of devils, and the world would be devastated. And after that, the Lord would create a new heaven and a new earth, the faithful having previously been airlifted to heaven in the pre-battle rapture, would be resurrected to inherit the reconstructed earth. The Messiah would return to rule from heaven, and the next thousand years would be known as the millennium, Latin for a thousand years. After this interim golden age of paradise on earth would come the final judgment and the eternal bliss of the blessed elect. This was the great mythos of Christianity since the book of Revelation was written sometime around 96 CE. So, the crucial question became, what was the starting date for Genesis? The most widely accepted date, printed for centuries in most Bibles, was determined by James Usher, Church of Ireland Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of all Ireland between 1625 and 1656. Bishop Usher labored over biblical genealogies and came up with a date for creation of October 22nd, in the year 4004 BCE. So 6,000 years from that date would take us to October 22nd of 1996. Uh, but when that fateful day of the apocalypse finally rolled around, nothing much happened. Now, there have been many prophets of doom. A Baptist preacher named William Miller predicted that the second advent of Jesus Christ would occur on or before March 21st, 1844. When this date passed uneventfully, Miller predicted a new date of April 18th, the same year. Again, the date passed, and Miller's disciple Samuel Snow came up with a revised date of October 22nd that year. The unfulfillment of these predictions became known as the Millerite Great Disappointment. Yes, they were actually disappointed that the world didn't end. Russian Mennonite minister Klaus Epp Jr. predicted that Christ would return 
on March 8th, 1889. And when that date passed uneventfully, he rescheduled it for 1891. Still nothing. Harold Camping was an American Christian radio broadcaster and president of Family Radio, which broadcast to more than 150 markets in the US. In 1992, he published a book titled 1994, in which he predicted the Christian apocalypse in September of that year. Needless to say, it uh, didn't happen. Christianity has always had a streak of millennial fever. At the end of the first millennium, approaching the year 1000, there was widespread fear and panic throughout Christendom, with reports of divine omens such as wars and rumors of wars, famines, plagues, comets, and eclipses heralding the end of the world. Although Christian millennialism is the most well-known example of a millenarian belief system, the application of 1,000-year cycles to major transitions of the world has occurred in many cultures and religions. It continues to this day, and not only among religions. Witness the worldwide panic regarding Y2K, the year 2000, and predictions that a millennial bug in the programming, unable to adjust computer dating to a new century, would devastate computer systems and the internet. As usual, nothing much happened. <laughs> well, dating the future is always tricksy. The 1960 movie, The Time Machine, produced by George Powell and based on the 1895 novel by H.G. Wells, predicted a global nuclear holocaust on August 19th, 1966. That date appearing on the time traveler's dashboard chronometer. In 1960, the Damoclean threat of a nuclear apocalypse seemed so imminent that dating it only six years later seemed perfectly reasonable. Indeed, at that time, virtually all prognostications assumed that civilization would soon be destroyed in a thermonuclear war and we'd all end up slugging it out with hideous mutants in the radioactive ruins. This was the plot of nearly every sci-fi movie in the late 50s through early 60s and numerous episodes of The Twilight Zone. Ah, but that didn't happen. Instead, something very different transpired in 1966 as the new TV series Star Trek premiered on September 8th of that year, inserting a hopeful future vision into what had essentially been a blank page. Star Trek's creator, Gene Roddenberry, is said to have explained his intention as, I'm trying to present a new vision of the future that will be so compelling that people will choose it over a global nuclear holocaust. And so he did. 55 years later, 10 TV series and 13 movies have created a different and hopeful future that has inspired our imaginations and technology towards interracial harmony, the personal computer revolution, and the exploration of space, and given us the greatest mission statement of all time, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Ah, well, the future ain't what it used to be. The 1968 movie by Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick, 2001, A Space Odyssey, predicted that by that year, we would have a lunar base, passenger space shuttles to a wheel-shaped space station, hotel, sentient computers, video phones, cryogenic suspension, and a manned expedition to Jupiter, Saturn in the book version, where we'd make our first contact with alien intelligence. Now, 20 years later, well, at least we have the video phones. <laughs> the rest we're still waiting for. And in 1984, Clark and Kubrick produced the sequel, Odyssey 2, The Year We Make Contact. This one was set 11 years ago in 2010. The Soviet Union, which as we know had actually collapsed in 1989, was still a superpower when Jupiter was ignited into a new mini sun. And all its moons, except Europa, which had its own life and destiny, were open to imminent human colonization. Right. And then, of course, there was the second Back to the Future movie, 
released in 1989 and set six years ago, October 21st, 2015, when we have flying cars powered by fusion engines and time travel. I'm waiting. Where is my flying car? <laughs> then came 1987 and the harmonic convergence, the world's first globally synchronized meditation on October 16th through 17th, sorry, August 16th through 17th, when a grand trine planetary alignment occurred with the Sun, Moon, Mars, Venus, and Mercury in Virgo, Jupiter in Aries, and Saturn and Uranus in Sagittarius. On that date, many people congregated at power centers such as Mount Shasta and Mount Fuji, where the spiritual energy was particularly strong. The belief then was that if 144,000 people assembled at these power centers and meditated for peace, the arrival of the new era of world peace would be facilitated. In actuality, many more people showed up and it worked. That year, Soviet leader Michael Gorbachev introduced a major policy reform known as perestroika, restructuring, overhauling the entire Soviet political and economic system. This caused the dissolution of the Soviet Union, revolutions in Eastern Europe, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and the end of the Cold War. All of us with this brings us to winter solstice of 2012. In 1967, the hit Broadway play and movie Hair offered up a vision of the age of Aquarius when peace will rule the planets and love will still steer the stars. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of visions, mystic crystal revelations, and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius, Aquarius. Ah, so what does the age of Aquarius mean? And when does it begin? The 12 astrological ages, or eons, mark divisions of the 25,920-year precessional cycle of the Earth's rotational axis in a vast circle around the heavenly constellation of Draco, the dragon. Just as we mark a clock face or a calendar into 12 equal hours or months for the purpose of timekeeping, so did ancient Babylonian astronomers in the second millennium BCE devised the zodiacal calendar, naming its 12 divisions for the constellations in the plane of the ecliptic, the plane in which all the planets revolve around the sun. Although the zodiacal constellations are of various sizes, the 12 divisions of the zodiac are all the same length, which is 30 degrees. One complete period of precession of the equinoxes through all 12 signs of the zodiac is called a great year, or platonic year of 25,920 years, rounded off to 26,000 years. Each zodiacal age of 30 degrees, therefore, lasts 2,160 years. And it's marked by which sign the sun appears to rise in at dawn of the vernal equinox. The past 2,160 years have been the age of Pisces, named for the constellation of Pisces the fish. Interestingly enough, a prime symbol for early Christianity, the dominant religion of that age. The next age is Aquarius, the water bearer. The hours of our daily clock reset at midnight and the zodiacal months of the year reset at winter solstice. These are fixed points in time that can be easily determined. The challenge for astronomers, astrologers and everyone else has been how to determine the point of midnight on the cosmic clock of the eons. Different astrologers have proposed various dates for the dawning of the age of Aquarius, which being the first sign of the zodiac, begins not just another eon, but an entire new great year or platonic year of 26,000 years. In their brilliant 1969 book, Hamlet's Mill, Giorgio di Santillana and Hertha von Dechen proposed a cosmological significance to the legendary mill or lathe of heaven recorded in the ancient sagas of the Gesta Danorum and the Finnish Kalevala, 
as well as the Hindu creation myth of the churning of the sea of milk that separated the lands, the Kurds, from the waters, the way. The spindle of this metaphorical cosmic mill is the rotational axis of the earth, which runs through the center of the earth from pole to pole and extends from the earth's north pole to Solaris, the North Star. This is also the trunk of the great world tree that the Norse call Yggdrasil. But there is also another important axis of the entire solar system represented by the poles of the ecliptic, which extends perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic from the center of the sun to the constellation of Draco. Due to the imbalance of the seas and continents, the rotating earth wobbles slightly on its axis, like a top that is running down. This wobble causes the position of the earth's north polar axis to describe a slow circle through the heavens around the stationary pole of the ecliptic at a latitude of 23.5 degrees, the angle at which the earth's axis is inclined or tipped relative to the plane of the ecliptic, south of the ecliptic pole in Draco. This corresponds to the latitude of the Arctic Circle, the location at which the midnight sun circles the horizon without setting on winter solstice. On the edge of the Arctic Circle, just off the coast of Norway, at Greenwich longitude one degree 15 minutes east, is the location of the Moskenstromen or Maelstrom, the legendary gigantic whirlpool described in the 13th century North Eddas. The Swedish Bishop Olus Magnus included the Moskenstromen in his 1539 map, Carta Marina, the map of the seas. It was exaggerated by Edgar Allan Poe in his 1841 short story, A Descent into the Maelstrom, and in Jules Verne's 1870 novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It also featured prominently in the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie. A complex system of tidal eddies and whirlpools, one of the strongest in the world, this is the actual place where the spindle of the ecliptic pole churns the earthly waters of the cosmic mill. The precession of the equinoxes is most readily noted by the day of the vernal equinox shifting backwards over time through all the signs of the zodiac. As the Earth's axis circles Draco, different stars in turn become the pole star. Now it is Polaris, Alpha Ursae Minoris. In 3000 BCE, it was Thuban, Alpha Draconis. 4,000 years from now, we will be in Cepheus. Another 5,000 years in Deneb, Alpha Cygni will be the pole star. In 4,000 years after that, it will be Vega, Alpha Lyrae. And in the year 24,000, it will be back to Thuban. And finally, 26,000 years from now, Polaris will again be the pole star. This chart shows the yearly movements of the sun through the zodiac. This phenomenon is called the precession of the equinoxes. And it takes precisely 25,920 years to complete the circle and come round again to the beginning. Thus that period is divided into 12 astrological ages or eons of 30 degrees or 2,167 years marked by the two points on opposite sides of the year where the extension of the Earth's equator, called the celestial equator, intersects the plane of the ecliptic. These points are the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, meaning equal night, and the zodiacal constellation in which the sun appears to rise on that day in spring gives us the names and symbolism of the eons. Here's a little chart of the history of the eons all the way back a ways. <laughs> For the past 2,160 years, the vernal equinox occurred in Pisces the fish. And so we consider this to have been the age of Pisces, also known as the Christian era. Synchronistically, as I mentioned before, the symbol of the fish was adopted by early Christians as a logo because the Greek word for fish, ichthys, serving as an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. But the vernal equinox has been slowly moving at the rate of one degree 
every 72 years toward the next constellation in turn, which is Aquarius. And in 2012, it fell directly on the cusp. Here's a diagram of the ecliptic and the celestial equator. So you can see how they relate. For in addition to the celestial equator of the earth and the ecliptic equator of the solar system, there is yet a third significant equatorial plane to consider, the plane of the disc-shaped Milky Way galaxy, which appears to us as a great milky band around the night sky. And just as the Earth's equator intersects with that of the solar system at the spring and fall equinoxes, so does the ecliptic equator intersect with that of the galaxy at two points. Ancient astronomers noted those two points, one in the northern sky at the cusp of Gemini and Taurus, and the other in the southern sky at the cusp of Sagittarius and Scorpio. These are the galactic equinoxes, and it was commonly believed that these two points were gateways through which souls passed into and out of our world from the heavens. Macrobius, in the late 4th century CE, described this in some detail. He said, the Milky Way girdles the zodiac, its great circle meeting it obliquely, so that it crosses at the two tropical signs of Gemini and Sagittarius. Natural philosophers name these the portals of the sun, because the solstices lie athwart the sun's path on either side, checking further progress and causing it to retrace its course across the belt beyond. Souls are believed to pass through these portals when going from the sky to the earth and returning from the earth to the sky. Well, because of the precessional cycle, the solstices have been slipping backwards through the zodiac, just as the equinoxes have. Winter solstice of 2012 occurred precisely at the point where the plane of the ecliptic intersects the galactic equator at the cusp of Sagittarius and Scorpio and a straight line through this point aligns directly with the immense black hole at the center of our galaxy, 26,000 light years away, against which the solstice sun rose on that morning. If we were sitting in a boat on the Arctic Circle, just off the coast of Norway at the location of the legendary Maelstrom, Greenwich latitude, one degree, 15 minutes east, at noon of December 21st, 2012, we would have seen the 12 constellations of the zodiac distributed all around the horizon. Directly overhead was the ecliptic North Pole. Due south, the sun appeared on the horizon, aligned with the center of our galaxy at the Sagittarius portal, the Golden Gate. Opposite on the north horizon would be the Gemini portal, the Silver Gate, the great star-strewn path of the Milky Way spanned the sky like a bridge between these portals, and the sun circled the horizon clockwise, passing through each sign of the zodiac every two hours. At midnight, the sun stood before the Silver Gate. On winter solstice of 2012, the intersection of the plane of the ecliptic with the galactic equator formed a great cosmic cross. Check out this picture with the sun in the center, positioned precisely over the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Many ancients called the Milky Way the way of the dead, the road on which the souls traveled between lives from one gate to another in preparation for rebirth. The dark path of dust that forms a line from galactic center towards the North Star was called Jabalba by the ancient Mayans the dark underworld realm of the dead, which corresponded to an actual labyrinthine complex of limestone caverns underlying their homeland on the Yucatan Peninsula. The Mayans believed that this cosmic alignment would thus open a stargate to the afterworld, and all beings would transition via that path to a new plane of spiritual evolution. Their intricate long count calendar therefore assigned to this state the end of the fifth world age or sun. In Western terms, this cosmological event marked the end of the Piscean age and the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And the prophesied new phase of spiritual evolution 
can only be the awakening of planetary consciousness, the awakening of Gaia herself. The last age of Aquarius, which began in the upper Paleolithic 26,000 years ago, has been called the creative explosion when humanity experienced an unprecedented emergence and proliferation of art and culture, remnants of which still astound us today in the form of exquisite cave paintings, engravings, and sculptures. These include animals, human figures, animal-human hybrids, handprints, and abstract signs and symbols, especially vulvas. Foremost and iconic among these are the countless small sculptures of lush female forms in every conceivable material, stone, bone, ivory, and fired clay. Doubtless, there were originally many carved of wood as well, painted on animal hides and woven into basketry designs, but none of these could have survived to the present time. Here's an image of the Venus of Willendorf, dated 24,000 BCE, exactly 26,000 years ago. What is most difficult, distinctive, about these plump little female figurines is the commonality of style, regardless of the medium. They stand with knees together and tiny feet slightly apart. Upper arms and elbows are against the sides and the thin forearms and hands, when they are indicated at all, curl up and over the prominent breasts. Their proportions are those of a woman looking down over her own body with no correction for perspective distortion. So the feet appear attenuated and insignificant while the breasts and belly predominate. Of a size and shape to be held comfortably in one hand, they are invariably faceless, indicating that they were not portraits of particular women, which we actually have as well, but rather of a generic archetype. Spanning a period of time from around 30,000 years ago to the end of the last ice age, 10,500 years ago, hundreds of them have been found from Spain to Siberia, and all are so similar in convention and style as if they had been made by the same artist. The first Paleolithic female figurine was discovered in 1864 by the Marquis de Vibray at an archaeological dig in Logerie Basse, Dordogne, France. Evidently assuming such images were made by men as erotic finishes, Vibray named his find the Venus Impudique, the immodest Venus in contrast to the modest Venus Pudica of ancient Greece. The term stuck, and such figures have been popularly called Venuses ever since. But I personally much prefer the toyn term coined by Maria Gambudist, matrikas or little mothers. For it seems evident to me they were made by women and represented the archetypal source of all fertility and life, the mother of all mothers, the great mother, Mother Earth. Now, Earth-centered spirituality is nothing new, even in the era of Western monotheistic domination. It is awakened in 60-year cycles back at least to the Italian Renaissance of the 1480s. These include the Reformation and Age of Exploration in the 1540s, the English Renaissance, the Golden Age of the 1600s, the scientific revolution in the 1660s, the European enlightenment of the 1720s, the French and American revolution, the age of reason as they called it in the late 1780s, the transcendentalist awakening of the 1840s, the golden dawn of the 1900s, and the new age psychedelic 60s, which saw the dawn of the current neo-pagan resurgence. In each of these cycles, certain common themes emerged, foremost among them being a romantic resurrection of classical pagan themes in the arts, poetry, music, literature, drama, religion, ritual, and spirituality. And the return of the goddess was a major focus of artists, musicians, and poets who claimed her patronage as muse. Now, in anticipation of the next cycle in the 2020s, the wheel is turning again, and consciousness of the goddess is re-emerging throughout the world. 
Tyler de Chardin proposed in his book, The Phenomenon of Man, a future coalescence of planetary consciousness, which he equated with the second coming of Christ. Noting the diversification of life forms throughout the evolutionary history of Earth, Chardin referred to the genesis of life as the alpha point, and thus the anticipated completion of what he discerned as the entire purpose of evolution, the planetarization of consciousness, he called the omega point. Chardin adopted the term noosphere, originally coined in 1926 by Vladimir Vernasky to designate an emergent planetary layer of consciousness after the geosphere, the rocky planet, the hydrosphere, the water, the atmosphere, the air, and the biosphere, life. And it has been imagined that this might come about as a kind of universal telepathy. But I think the emergence and rapid evolution of the internet is already providing the seeds of a technological vehicle of global consciousness through which this awakening will inevitably manifest. In a 1926 interview with Collier's Magazine, visionary genius Nikola Tesla prophesied, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is, all things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole. We shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through television and telephony, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite intervening distances of thousands of miles. And the instruments through which we shall be able to do this will be amazingly simple compared with our present telephone. A man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket Yeah, Tesla. Perhaps the emergence and rapid evolution of the internet and the World Wide Web are already providing the seeds of a technological newosphere of global consciousness through which this awakening will inevitably manifest. We might equate such an event with the awakening of consciousness in our own minds as the billions of neurons in our brains link up synergistically. Just so shall we participate in the awakening of Gaia herself, in our full apotheosis. Ah, so we come to the end of the Mayan calendar, or is it the beginning? The 25,920 year long count calendar of the Mayans with its division into five world ages, which records one full processional cycle of the earth's axis among the stars, finally reached its end on winter solstice of 2012. And the calendar for 2012 that I had up on my wall also came to an end on December 31st. But when a calendar ends, you don't burn down the house or blow up the planet. You just take it down and put up a new one. And the fun thing about putting up a new calendar is that you get to decide what it will look like. Shall it be a calendar featuring images of cats Dragons, babes, racing cars, wizards, spaceships, Hubble telescope photos. Shall it list secular or religious holidays, birthdays of movie stars, full moons and sabbats. Each time we put up a new calendar, we get to choose for another year. And so it is for the new calendar, we get to choose for the next Bacton, world age or eon, the possibilities are limitless. And as always at such transitional times, we have the opportunity to choose foolishly or wisely. I believe, however, that most people on earth hold certain dreams and visions in common. Dreams of freedom, liberation, personal empowerment, peace, harmony, love, balance, hope, prosperity, happy children, and a healthy planet. And sunrise on the morning of December 22nd was literally the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Astrological attributes of Aquarius include enlightenment, the revelation of truth, and the expansion of consciousness. While the symbol and sacrament 
of Aquarius is obviously water, the universal medium of life. Water shared is life shared. Aquarius is an air sign signifying communication, networking, ideas, wisdom, air travel, and even space travel and colonization as we embark upon the great diaspora of humankind, Gaia's progeny among the stars. And most importantly, the coalescence of consciousness on a global scale, the awakening of Gaia. And just like the great awakening last time around, 26,000 years ago, we can expect a new creative explosion such as the world has not seen since the last ice age. <sighs> and so with that, I'm now open to discussion, questions, answers, comments. Have at it. So I have one from the audience. I want to thank everybody. If you have a question, just kind of open up your mic and your camera and we'll let you uh, come on down. Um, but um, the question was simply this, it says, we've heard recently about the idea of, that, of the idea of age of Aquarius, but it was supposed to be more peaceful than this. Can you explain why it's not been more peaceful? Well, we're just getting started. We're just uh, just barely over the edge here. You know, these cycles last, you know, over 2000 years. And, um, you know, just a couple of years into it, we're still in the transitional phase and we can expect that to go on for a little while. You know, it's like um, the monthly cycle is 30 days, but the moon rises of the full moon on three days. There's three days of the full moon, three days for the werewolf to howl, you know. So there's that little timing. The same thing occurs at the solstices and equinoxes. There's actually several days that the um, sunrise and sunset are virtually the same. So we're in that phase in between. The, the hand is still ticking from uh, midnight to 1 a.m. You know, or to from midnight to one minute after midnight, really. We're just barely there. But actually, um, considering all things, having everybody inside and, and out of, off the streets, as it were, for a global pandemic is kind of peaceful as it goes. You know, you can sort of think that maybe Gaia said, just send us all to our room for the occasion. Well, that was anybody? the second question I had gotten. People had said, are we gonna see, is Gaia vengeful? Is she mad at us? Is she going to do more terrible things? It's one of the questions we got out of, uh, the cat group. You know, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, we are not separate from Gaia. We are not only her children, we are also cells in her body. The idea of her vengefulness towards us, it's like, are we vengeful to our you know, own internal systems? Well, if we have a disease uh, that is destructive, like cancer, particularly cancer, you know, we certainly might want to, you know, uh, curb it to store it down. I'm not sure that we think of it vengefully, although maybe we do, maybe we hate our cancer and we wanna you know, punish it and get even with it. But what's more likely is that our body's antibody systems get kicked into force and they start moving to try to you know, curb the cancer and to um, cut it back. Because a cancer is when some of the cells go all out of control and start reproducing like crazy and dumping toxins into the systems. And to the extent which humanity has behaved as a cancer, we can imagine that humanity is going to be activating Gaia's um, antibodies. And I believe that that's what viruses and especially pandemics actually are. So it's not so much of a conscious attempt to uh, get even as it's just a natural organic response to, um, to a cancer. All right. So we have great people in our audience, uh, Donald, Silas, uh, Bruce, uh, Scara, James. We have a great group of people. So feel free if you have any questions. Um, this is coming out of the Witch School International. And that is, where is magic involved in this? Because you gave a great, ah. because they, they said you gave a great scientific answer, but they were wondering where the magic is. 
Well, you know, you really can't separate magic from everything else. Um, <laughs> so I seldom do so. Um, magic in the definition that we use in my circles is probability enhancement. You know, in conscious activation of magic uh, involves intention. You're, you're setting an intention and then you're manifesting all the probabilities in that direction. It's like you're, you know, piling up stuff on one end of the balance beam and some of the things you pile up may be big rocks and boulders. And sometimes it's just down to little grains of sand, but everything that you're putting up there is shifting the balance, shifting the probabilities. So the extent to which, as I said in my talk, that we choose the calendar we're going to put up, we choose and envision the new age. This is an amazing time on a mythical level because 2020 is equated with things like 2020 vision and 2020 hindsight and 2020 foresight. So the extent by which we ourselves envision the world that we're going to have in this cycle is the extent to which it will manifest that way. Think of that, the previous cycle in the 60s, all of the movements that shaped the world and transformed it occurred during that period. The um, you know, civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the free speech movement, the sexual freedom movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, and of course the, the pagan and, and Wiccan movements, all of these things, the ecological environmental movement, all these movements emerged by people envisioning the world they wanted to have. Now, it didn't come out exactly, but it shaped the world. The, the imagining and visioning shapes the world. And on a scientific level, at the most fundamental level of quantum physics, we have now come to understand that you cannot separate out the material world from consciousness itself. We actually, literally, in the laboratory, in the, you know, in the split screen experiments, things like that, double slit experiments, we, our uh, consciousness actually determines the outcome. Is the uh, Schrodinger's cat alive or dead? Well, we decide that. Our own consciousness decides that. At the fundamental level beneath everything else in the universe, we go down past the uh, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, all the way down, down to the very bottom where there is no objects, there's no stuff. There is only the quantum field. And the quantum field is deeply comprehended these days by the leading thinkers in quantum physics to be pure consciousness. And this is what underlies the entire universe. And we are part of that. We are extensions of universal consciousness, just like the water in this cup is an extension of the universal water that permeates the cosmos. If the water is not separate, you know, it just pours it into separate vessels, you know, but the vessels may appear to be separate, but the water is universal. And the same with us, all these separate vessels, these fleshy avatars, they all include the same universal spirit that we share with all life everywhere. So there's where the magic is. Beautifully stated. Um, so we're with Oberon Zell. We wanna thank you for joining us this evening. And you can find Oberon Zell on the new uh, platform, which is going to transform how pagans communicate, a pagan world. You can also find him at oberonzell.com. And throughout the things, he has many beautiful books that he has written um, and, and explores these ideas. He is also, um, is it chancellor or is it the, uh, of a uh, gray school? I'm the headmaster of the gray school. Um, he is also the primus of the church of all worlds which is gonna be very interesting because I think in, they're talking about like less than three years, they're gonna bring the movie out, Stranger in Strange Land. I'm waiting. They, I, I understand know. it's supposed to be a mini series, but it, it keeps being announced that it's coming, but it's, we're still waiting like Godot, you know? I, and Bruja uh, Scary, I call, sorry, I call, remembers the book. So we will explore more of Oberon's world, but you can find him again, oberonzell.com is probably the most singular comprehensive way to find him on the web. And of course, check out Pagan World. We're going to be bringing you a lot of Oberon because he's the number one of our new social communication platform and directory. Any last words, Oberon? Well, I think I've covered things pretty well. For the, for I think you've done first, a great uh, job. Talk here. I'll be talking about many more things as, as uh, these sessions go on. I'm looking forward every month to the, the Ides 
for my uh, next show. And, and, um, and I hope you'll all turn up and I hope you'll spread the word because if you enjoyed this, there's a lot more to come. Just thought we'd kind of start with a basic foundation here with the age of Aquarius and, and then I'll go on and continue. What does all this mean? And expect to see these uh, further talks illustrated with slideshows that will bring them to life as well. And I look forward to seeing uh, many of you in many other venues like this, of course, because I'm doing lots of uh, online broadcasts and Zoom meetings and such. Once when you're able to get past this particular pandemic isolation and have festivals again, I look forward to returning to seeing you in the flesh. It's a lot more fun to sit around the campfire and, and hang out and share stories and songs and meat and weed and all of that. But, um, but this is an amazing opportunity that we have to do this. And it's going to change the shape of this period. The fact that it's come into here now and that it's so specifically manifests Nikola Tesla's vision of you know nearly a century ago to envision this era. It's, it's rather remarkable. And Ed, you said something about something you just came across James Lovelock's newest book. Would you like to say something about that? I think it's- um, I've done a little tiny bit of reading. I don't know much. It's called The Nova Scene or The Era of Higher Intelligence. Um, I'm a big, well, if people don't know, I'm a big follower of, of uh, theogenesis. I've been a big proponent of it once I learned about it from a very young age and, and Oberon beat Lovelock to the actual ideology of this. But uh, let's give the scientists credit. He's written a number of books, he's a leading environmentalist. He's really changed the way the world works. And he's, <clears throat> his last book, 2016, basically said it was over. There was not much we could do about transforming it. And that these ideas of evolution and die-offs is a very okay thing in the world of Gaia, even if it's not an okay thing for us. We may not like it, but Gaia continues. And now he's basically saying that artificial intelligence and intelligence systems are next, or looks like the next evolution, and, and that we're going to see a period of time where humans and Gaia is going to force humans and, and, and cybernetic systems to work together, and that we are going to see a self-regulating system that incorporates a Gaia mind, a Gaia intelligence that she's manifesting her intelligence through artificial intelligence, which is something I deeply believe in, but it was an amazing piece. I am, I've ordered the book, I gotta read it. And this was written by a hundred year old man. So I wanna see what, you're not that far. We, we got 22 more years. Working on it, heading there. I, I, I definitely um, mm -hmm. have no plans to quit before then. Or and after, think, probably. And I think Pagan <laughs> I have for, corresponded with Lovelack over the years. Um, yeah. ever since, uh, you know, he first came out with his stuff in 1973. And, and I sent him my material and we corresponded. And he has a, a millennial Gaia statue that uh, he has. And um, we've had a very friendly correspondence over time. And we have a slightly different um, approach to the idea. We're not, uh, uh, the perspective is different. He was looking at, Gaia from the outside in as an atmospheric biochemist. And I was looking at Gaia from the inside out from um, uh, uh, cellular um, uh, biology, embryology, evolution, all of that stuff, which uh, stuff that he wasn't really familiar with, or for that matter, mythology. So it's interesting that these totally different perspectives looking from the outside and the inside have come together in such a perfect harmony and work so well together. What's interesting is that his approach has become widely known in the scientific community, and mine only appears to be known in the magical community. So, um, you know, there's there's very little overlap so far between these two, and I hope that that will change in time to come, so that the more scientists are more aware of what we're doing over here on the on the magical side. I do too, because I'm I live in a little bit of both worlds. You know, people know that me as a bit of a scientific nerd. It is interesting that I've been able to help this year. And I really am grateful for it. And I'm grateful for you doing this. We are going to continue on doing this. Uh, check out Pagan World. It's going to be a lot of, it is going to be where pagans can enter into the cybernetic world. And if I have anything to say of it, and over the last 25 years, I've really worked hard at this, is that we will be able to continue to communicate. But like Byron Ballard talks about, I want us to be able to relocalize. I do think over the last 10 years, I think one of the biggest things we've done is we become really super national and super international and super global. I think we forgot one of the things that makes paganism great is that 
think globally, but act locally. Right. Um, techno mage, yes, it's me, I'm the techno mage. Um, known through the community wide over. And so I think that there's something, and I'm so grateful for you being here and being willing to, to give us this, um, the ideology. I mean, I think if people ask me what I do, is that one of the things I do is I try to bring Oberon's vision to life through the scientific, and it's, and it's tough because he has such a great and wide vision. And sometimes you just have to do the work. And today we're doing the work. Well, thank you, Oberon. Oberonzell.com is the primary way you can reach him. You can also find him on Peg and World. Go to the directory. He is the number one person right after our administrator. And so he is the, he's the leading of it. He, it's his very own social media platform in some ways. And um, well, uh, thank you and blessed be and may you never thirst. And, and may you never thirst as well. And all of you out there,